about the fact that if you live in the middle of Harpenden, you can choose whatever secondary school you want, but if you live in Wheat Hampstead, you're lucky to get a decent school place anywhere. It's not fair, really, is it? Not fair. Uh, or, uh, ladies, um, can I ask you, how do you feel about the fact that uh, men doing the same job as you get paid 20 to 30% more for doing the same work? It's not fair, really, is it? Uh, how do we feel about the uh, postcode lottery of the health service, where sometimes you get treatment funded if you live, but the other side of the road, not funded? It's not fair, really, is it? So how do we feel about the millions of people who don't have access to safe drinking water, don't regularly have electricity, can't get basic health care or primary education? It's not fair, really, is it? So our God is a God of justice, a God who cares passionately about all his children. He has a special concern, it seems, for the poor and the vulnerable. The widows and the orphans and the migrants and the strangers and the foreigners get singled out again and again in the Bible. The way that people are treated matters to God. And so it matters to us as well as his children. So for Linda and myself, it's been a real privilege over the last two weeks to be, on, to be your ambassadors, sent out by you, going on your behalf to the DR Congo to stand alongside our Congolese sisters and brothers, learning a bit more about what their life is like uh, and worshipping Christ with them. So Linda's going to set the scene as we share a bit more of that with you now. Picture the scene. Everywhere is covered in a thick layer of fine orangey-brown dust. The few trees and straggly shrubs at the roadside also appear brown, and the dust in the air colours the setting sun a deep red every evening. The roads are broken and pitted with enormous craters, causing traffic to weave around to find a way through. The sides of the road are embedded with layers of rubbish, mostly plastic. There's no organised rubbish collection here, and as each family burns their rubbish in the evening, the air is filled with oily black smuts. Water is collected from standpipes, or the river, and heated over charcoal stoves, which is also the main method of cooking. Electricity is unreliable with daily power cuts, and those who can afford it need to run generators. There's no postal service, and although many people have mobile phones, communication is really difficult. This is the reality of light in Lubambashi, DR Congo's second largest city for most families a country which is rich with natural mineral resources, but only the very few get to enjoy the benefits of that. So I'd like to, uh, to tell you the story of two of the children uh, that Linda and I met uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the first is of uh, a young boy called Samuel who was uh, 11 years old. Uh, I met him on his first trip to the day centre which Cambilio runs, uh, and he was visiting there for the first time, uh, having uh, been in the market, huge, great, big, sprawling market where everyone does their shopping, and the, the thousands of street children who are homeless live in the market, uh, eking out a subsistence existence uh, by running errands for people uh, and by uh, occasionally stealing the food that they need to eat. So once he had been cleaned up and interviewed, uh, he had been to, or once, uh, uh, Samuel had been told that if he came to the day centre run by Kimbilio, he would be safe for the day, he would have the chance to wash his clothes and have a wash himself, and he would get a good, honest meal. So he came along, uh, and once he had been uh, cleaned himself up, because it was his first visit, the staff interviewed him they found out he had only been living on the streets for two nights. And the staff were really excited about this because Samuel had not yet experienced the beatings that street children often get. He hadn't joined one of the gangs that they form 
And he hadn't even tried any of the drugs that they use to get by. So they realised that if they acted quickly, they could stop Samuel from spiralling down into that uh, terrible situation. So uh, he admitted that he was on the streets because he had stolen from his granddad who he lived with. He had stolen some money that he was supposed to go and use to run an errand. And when he'd come back at the end of the day, not having bought the things he was supposed to and not having the money, his grandma told him to get out, otherwise she would beat him. So Samuel got out of the house and ran away and ended up in the market. But two days later, here he was at the Kimbilio Day Centre and the staff uh, were pleased to find out that he knew where his parents lived and he knew where his grandparents were. Now you or I would just pick up the phone and say, uh, we've got your son, your grandson, he's safe and well here, do come and pick him up. But without a phone system and with limited staff, they had to wait until the end of the day, find two staff who would volunteer to work a couple of hours overtime and go with Samuel to his grandparents' house to see if they would have him home and promise not to beat him. So they found those staff, and the staff went out to the other side of the city to Samuel's home, only to find no one at home. So suddenly the next team of the Kimbilio springs into action. Can they juggle it and find a space for Samuel to stay the night? Well, of course they can do. So in the transition home, which is where the children move to after the day centre when they confirm they don't want to be on the streets anymore, uh, we found Samuel a place to stay. Uh, so the idea is that uh, over the next few days, they've left a message with the grandparents, Samuel is safe and well, we've got him here, uh, and we'll come and visit again. Uh, they will go and uh, see if Samuel can be reintegrated into his family. There's every hope that he can do, uh, and we hope that that will be uh, a real success story, a quick win for Kimbilio. Kimbilio's objective is that every child that they work with should be reintegrated with their family, staying perhaps with their parents or maybe an aunt or an uncle or, or grandparents if necessary. But it's not always possible. So let me tell you about uh, Rodrigue. Rodrigue uh, had, uh, had uh, come to Kimbilio uh, when uh, he was 14 years old. He's 19 now, uh, uh, but... Um, when he was 14, uh, his stepmom, stepmother uh, had kicked him and his two other brothers, two younger brothers, out of the house. And when the Kimbilio staff uh, met Rodrigue, he'd been, he and his brothers had been on the street for some time. They had spiralled down into uh, drugs and violence and gangs. But they wanted to come out of that cycle. They wanted to uh, be in the day, to, to find accommodation and security again. But when Kimbilio visited his family, it became clear that reintegration was not going to be possible. So rather than going to the transition houses, uh, uh, Rodrigue and his brothers moved to the long-term house, uh, which is called Maison Kimbilio. Uh, and it was there that they went to, sc uh, from there that they walked three or four kilometers to school each day. It was from there that they lived and they had health care and uh, and the, the love of, of house parents uh, and the support uh, that Kimbilio offers. And through that, uh, uh, Rodrigue uh, and his brothers have worked hard. Uh, when he was 18, uh, Rodrigue had to leave Kimbilio because they work with children and not with adults. But Kimbilio helped him to get set up with somewhere to live. They found him an apprenticeship as an electrician. And the day that I met Rodrigue, he had come to install the first solar panels on the roof of the boys' house where he had lived for all those years. So from now on, uh, the boys' house will have uh, light and electricity in the evenings uh, and the dusty television which sits in the corner will be dusted off and I'm sure will get some use. Rodrigue is one of the success stories of Kimbilio where they haven't been able to reintegrate them with their family but they have helped the boys and the girls to grow up and to find a future with uh, apprenticeships um, either in building or carpentry or as electricians. Or uh, there are other projects. They run a sewing project for women uh, and a beauty salon project 
uh, to train beauticians as well. Back to Linda. So as we were walking or driving around Lubambashi, um, it was easy at first to become discouraged by the dirt, the rubbish, the poverty and the corruption. And we might despair about the lives of those estimated 15,000 street children just in Lubambashi. But God is at work there. The staff of Kimbilio are clothing these children, feeding them and giving them something to drink. They're taking them in and they're freeing them from the prison and the stigma of the streets. They're giving them a future. They're giving them hope. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us, one that we can never repay. But in caring for these children, the least of God's children, Cambilio are doing it for him. They are clothing him, they're feeding him, they're freeing him from prison. As God's people, God's church, we must reflect the great love that we receive from him and we must reflect it outwards to others. This summer, St. Helens will do that here with our summer hampers and our children's holiday clubs. Cambilio does this every day despite all the challenges they face. I'd like to finish with a prayer which was written by Teresa of Avila in the 16th century. So let us pray. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which the compassion of Christ must look out on the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless his people. Amen.